Good morning, River Valley. What a wonderful day. <gasps> Look who's here. Oh, good morning. Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Samson. Everything back. Ugh. Were you our bus driver two years ago? I was. For a weekday. Well, I, I, you don't remember me. I'm Phil Snow, and I was one of the helpers that rode on the bus with the yeah. South School kids. I did some. Uh, South, I did South one year, and then I did Post and Rosie. Yeah, yeah. They wanted me to do some this year, but I retired. Oh, you did? Yeah. I'm going to have to send this bill. Wow. Oh, I yeah. And, you know, I do miss it. You can bounce around in the bus or bounce around in the semi. It's not good for my back. Yeah. They told me the other day I had to get rid of this business. Yeah. <laughs> Stevie, say good morning. Say good morning. Good morning. Yay, thank you.
Amen. Well, Hosanna, that's Hebrew. That, they uh, said that when Jesus came into the city on the, the, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He was crucified one week later. They really didn't know what they were saying, perhaps, then. He did come to the city to save them at the end of the week with his death. Amen? Amen. And we, on our 2020 vision side of history, we sing Hosanna a little bit differently than they did. We know we have a Savior, and we know without him, there is no salvation. It's only through the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We welcome you this morning. We're glad that you're here. Thank you so much for deciding that the Lord is so important to you that uh, this day uh, you chose to be here this morning. And um, we welcome those online as well. And um, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to continue singing His praises. Heavenly Father, May we hear the sound, even if figuratively, of hearts returning to you, lives being changed and made new under the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, we say we welcome you here, Lord Jesus. May it be so in each heart in this room. As a group, as individuals, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus. We welcome you. Live and reign and preside in our lives, Lord. At the beginning of this week, may we endeavor to let you do just that through your Holy Spirit's leading. Father, may it be all about you, your glory, and for your kingdom's sake. We pray today our, our praise is pleasing to you as we offer it to you, our Lord and our God. We pray in the blessed, holy, wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship.
services, if you, uh, for whatever reason, young, old, whatever, bad knees, you need to sit down, don't you worry about what people think around you, that you're praising the Lord still, that's a good thing, and um, nobody's going to judge you for that, so if we're standing a little too long for you during a worship service, please, please, please have a seat, that's no problem at all, let's continue Amen. to worship the Lord together, that's what we've come here today to do, He's
as we prepare to gather around the table, just a little story that I stole from a man named Mac Turner. Uh, goes like this. He said he was sitting at the breakfast table, drinking his coffee, and his uh, wife came, brought in some toast. He looked down at it, and it was like black. He said, thank you, dear. Got the butter, got the toast, ate it. Said it was wonderful. Got in the car, went to work. He said, while I was on my way to work, I thought to myself, why did I accept the burnt toast when my standard is not burnt toast? What what made me settle for less than my standards? And his point here was from a safety perspective that, that if we have standards, we shouldn't settle for anything less. Our God has standards. Amen. And he told us that you must believe in his son. And then he sent him to the cross to die for us. I don't think we can make any exceptions to that other than to believe. Right. When we come to the table, he didn't accept burnt toast. We can't be burnt toast. Right. We just can't. We have to live up to his standards. So as we come to him today, as we gather around the table, we need to humble ourselves and remember he sent his only son to die a terrible, horrible, agonizing death for us. We need to honor that. We need to remember that. So as we go to the table today, remember the sacrifice he made. Remember his body that was broken for us. Remember his blood that was poured out so that we are so close. Let's go to the prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the sacrifice, for the gift you gave us, for sending your son to the cross to die for us. But he didn't know us yet. Lord, thank you. For the cross, thank you for his broken body. Thank you for the blood that was poured out so that we could come to you on that day pure and spotless. Lord, thank you so much for Jesus Christ. And it is always in his name we pray to you. Amen. Amen. church today. It's time for our children to depart and uh, get their teaching. We are so grateful every week that there's adults ready to teach the children and, and they have quality teaching time while we uh, uh, look into God's Word. Uh, welcome on this uh, Labor Day weekend. Thank you for being here today. In each row there is a white uh, notebook. If someone would grab that notebook uh, uh, let us know you're here today, leave a name, address, email, phone number, or a prayer request that uh, we can connect with you concerned. Uh, today's another good day. It's a holiday. I'm glad you're here. I hope you have some plans to rest and relax uh, 
both today and tomorrow. We're going to have to work on Labor Day. Uh, but we have labored through the book of John. We have preached for 20 weeks, and today makes uh, week 21, and we have taken a chapter a week, and we've exposed what John wrote about the life of Jesus. Hope you have your Bible. I have my uh, little cell phone and my Bible on the phone. And there are a lot of lessons in John 21, and I hope you'll turn there and follow along as well. we try to answer the key question, how did the disciples recognize Jesus was resurrected? I have three answers for that uh, that we find in this chapter, but there's a lot of lessons even within those three. First of all, Jesus was recognized by the disciples by a miracle he performed after the resurrection. And Jesus was so much that he was especially a miracle worker. And I, I just want to know, have you ever seen a miracle in your life? Uh, there's this old story, it's football season, John McKay, a former college coach who went on to coach in the NFL, tells of the time that he and his old coaching buddy from college, Bear Bryant, at the University of Alabama back in that day, he raised that program to very high standards and national championships. But Bear Bryant was full of confidence, and one day, John McKay and Bear Bryant went out duck hunting. And the bear was so supremely confident, he said, I could shoot a duck with my eyes closed. Well, McKay tells the story of one time when they were out hunting, and we were out hunting ducks. He said, finally, after three hours, we found one lonely duck. And that duck began to fly, and Bear raised his gun, and Bear shot. But he said, that duck is still flying till this day. And he said, the bear watched that duck fly away, and he said to me, John, you're now witnessing a genuine miracle. There flies a dead duck. <laughs> well, that's not a miracle. That's not the kind of things that Jesus did that showed he was the Son of God, the Messiah, that he had all authority and power on earth, heaven and earth. No, no. We want to look at a true miracle that came from Jesus. And we get it after the resurrection. It proves who he is and that he was risen from the dead in John 21. Peter is a professional fisherman. He probably thinks I could fish in day or night and I could catch anything out on the sea. But what we find is he spends all night fishing. He can't catch a single thing. And then voila. Bam! Jesus comes along and he performs a miracle. So I want you to follow along and I want you to see how this is uh, uh, presented to us. John writes of this story after the resurrection, verse 1. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. Now the question might be, you know, the resurrection takes place in Jerusalem. Why are all, all, they, all the way up to the north by the Sea of Galilee just... A few days after the second presentation of Jesus to the disciples in the upper room, probably the eighth day after the resurrection, why are they now at the Sea of Galilee? Well, Matthew 28 reports that the angel at the tomb told the women, do not be afraid, go tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. And so God is orchestrating a reunion up in Galilee of Jesus and his disciples sometime after he came the second first day of the week when he presented himself to Thomas. So God is in control. He's working behind the scenes. And so the disciples are up in Galilee at the Sea of Galilee and they were there out of obedience. And you know, we need to be in a walk with the Lord of obedience for him to truly work in our lives. But while they're there, there's this backdrop that they're obedient, that they really don't know what Jesus is going to do and what he wants them to do. We've got to remember the backdrop 
it is kind of like the uh, old uh, TV show, The Biggest Loser. And the storyline of that show was there's a lot of people struggling to lose weight, and they are trying to unload a heavy burden, and the show uh, shows how they go through the process of, of uh, being the biggest loser. Well, at the Sea of Galilee, you might remember in just the days before, Peter and the disciples were among the biggest losers. Peter, especially his failures, are well documented. Remember, number one, in the upper room, he said, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. Then Jesus proceeded to do so. And in the upper room, he also said that I will the wall fall away. I will never fall away. And then he does. Number two, they go to the Garden of Gethsemane and he cuts off Malchus' ear and the Lord rebukes him and heals Malchus' ear. And then, of course, later during the rest of Jesus, everybody remembers Peter's most denials of, of our Lord three times before the rooster crowed. And so deep down inside in this backdrop of being in Galilee, it still resonates. Boy, I let my Lord down. He, he, when I need, he needed me most, I wasn't there. And, and it's understandable. He might even think, I think the Lord probably would want to wash his hands of me. But I'm going to go to Galilee just as he commanded. And so he's there. And we almost get the idea that being in Galilee... It's a miraculous thing that when nobody else really wanted Peter around, it's Jesus who wants to spend time with Peter. Well, despite all the failures, Jesus shows up with Peter, and it says in verse 2, it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, which means the twin, Nathaniel from Canaan in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that would be James and John, and two other disciples were together. Peter said, I'm going out to fish. And they said, we'll go with you. And so they go out, they get into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Professional fishermen fishing all night and they catch nothing. Verse 4 says, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize yet it was Jesus. He called out to them. He said, friends, have you any fish? No, they answered. Verse 6, he said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Wow! A miracle there in Galilee. Do you remember up in the upper room among the many things Jesus taught these disciples? He said this phrase, apart from me, you can do nothing. And I think that's true. I think apart from Jesus, we can't be the spouse we're supposed to be. I don't think we can be the parent God wants us to be. I don't think we can be the employee, the neighbor, the friend, or the person of God apart from Jesus. When we walk with Jesus and we're in concert with him and we listen to what he says and we obey, we can become powerful forces of saying God's word in our lives. Jesus said, fish on the right side of the boat. Do you suspect if they threw the nets on the left side that they would have been successful? No, I think they would have failed again. But because they obeyed exactly as the Lord commanded, they were blessed with what is a, another miracle they knew came from the Lord. Verse 7 says, Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. 
And as soon as Simon heard him, he said, It's the Lord. Simon wrapped his outer garment around him. Some believe he might have even been pretty scantily clad, if not naked, for he had taken the garment off. He jumped into the water. Verse 8. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the full men of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. Do you get the picture? It's the Lord. Peter puts on some clothing. He swims to the shore. He does his Michael Phelps imitation. And he swims a hundred yards in the water. Now that right there might be a miracle. Can you can you swim a hundred yards if you were seeing the Lord today? But Peter realized it was Jesus. And all they had done was just obey, fish on the right side of the boat. And with that obedience, Jesus rewarded them with a miraculous catch. And so they recognized Jesus by this wonderful miracle. And there's two things I don't want you to miss. Don't miss all the miracles there at the Sea of Galilee performed by Jesus. Some point out there are two miracles in this brief story. Jeffrey King says, I am, if I'm not um, uh, mistaken, the first miracle was that Jesus Christ all night deliberately kept every fish in Galilee out of their nets. <laughs> and then the second miracle was when Jesus directed all 153 large fish, the Bible say, into the net the next morning. So the same Lord who directed them away one day directed the fish into the net the next day. And miracle, miracle, miracle from our Lord. And I don't want you to miss the place of this miracle. Jesus sent the disciples to Galilee, the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus meets Peter there in the identical way that he first met Peter there three years earlier. If you turn to Luke 5, it tells the story of how Jesus met Peter three years earlier at the Sea of Galilee on that same seashore. It says that Simon had been fishing all night and he then had caught nothing and he told Simon, drop your nets into the deeper water and when he did, he had a boatload of fish again. In his obedience that first time, Peter and his partners caught so many fish, such a large number of fish, that their nets began to break, verse 7 of chapter 5. So they signaled to their partners and the other boat to come help them. They came, and both boats were so full, they began to sink. That's what had happened three years earlier. And that first miraculous moment when this took place the second time, wow, it's Jesus, it's the Lord. He's doing it again here in this familiar place. And so John 21 shows us a deja vu moment for Peter. And it's a second miracle in the same place, the place where he first met the Lord. And it was on that first time Jesus said, come follow me, I'll make you fishers of I want you to know, I think the Lord repeats miracles in the same place often today. I, I think he performs miracles in your home every day, every week, every life. You see, every morning you have your feet hit the floor. You've got the miracle of another day. Amen. And I think the Lord performs miracles here in this church today. A couple weeks ago, uh, we sent out a prayer request concerning one of our memberships here. I'm going to point it out. She's on the back of the Pam Reed. And they gave me a text to put out to everybody on our prayer list. And it basically said her blood work was doing good. You, you know she has a cancer in the blood. She's fighting it with God's help. And the blood work required procedures and prayers and, 
And then the report says she's staying at 1.2, which is stable. And then she said, I've even had weight loss. And we put out how many pounds she'd even lost. We won't say what that is today. If you want to ask her, you can. But with that text to me that I could share to you, what they said was, God gets all the honor and praise. In Jesus' name, we thank him all. Amen. And she knows she's had a miracle in her life, day by day. Now today, I want to also praise Kathy Lundy texted me this Thursday. And she said, I want you to announce this from the pulpit. And so I am right now. Kathy, you know, we've been praying for her. She had a tumor on her lungs and did a procedure. And, and there was some malignancy, but it did not go into the lymph nodes. And here's what she said in her follow-up. I want to thank everyone for their support, their prayers. God has listened to them because I came through surgery without any issues. It was only a stage one tumor. Mm. Never progressed to the lymph nodes. Everyone prayed for that. And it was answered and I, after going back to the doctor on Thursday, we found out I don't need radiation or chemotherapy. So another prayer has been answered. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yes. Yes. And she says, I love my River Valley family. And we ought to give Kathy and Pam a hand. But better yet, we ought to give our Lord Jesus Christ a hand. Yes. Amen. You see, the miracles of healings often take in the same place. And we're reminded of the holy place where we connected with God through Christ. And that there we are just brought to new life again by that resurrected Lord. And so on this day in John 21, some number of days, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, after the resurrection of Jesus. They're up in Galilee. And the disciples are hauling in a boatload of fish. And they realize, it's the Lord. He's alive. He's well. And they saw him as a miracle worker. And it changed their lives. And then quickly after the 100-yard dash by swimming to the seashore, they see Jesus clearly as a servant leader. You see, the disciples next see Jesus by his compassion, leading them to continue to follow him. Look at verse 9. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Verse 10. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've caught. So Simon Peter came back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153 Fishermen got the fish. But even so many that the net was not torn. Verse 12, Jesus said, come and have breakfast. And so there on the seashore of Galilee, the disciples bring their boat. They're weary, they're cold from a night of fishing on the lake. But they found out that our Lord had already fixed breakfast for them. And I want you to notice just two things he does for them. He invites them to contribute their efforts to that particular task. He said, bring some of the fish you caught. And notice that he met their physical needs. Come and have breakfast. Come eat around the fire. Do you realize the word breakfast means break? From fast. You, you slept all night, or in this case, they worked all night. They have not eaten. They're hungry and they're breaking their fast. And at this campfire meal, Jesus invites them to breakfast, to dine with him, to commune with him, to participate together in an intimate fellowship. I want your company. And you know that roof there. They recognized him as Lord. I, I, I heard this story years ago of a group of students who were asked by their teacher at school to list the seven wonders of the world. 
And like most of us, uh, we, we could probably remember a few of them. Egypt's Great Pyramids, the Taj Mahal, the Great Grand Grand Canyon, the Panama Canal, Empire State Building, St. Peter's Basilica, China's Great Wall, and you might have a favorite young man. In fact, there was one little child, student, in the classroom that was still feverishly writing, and none of those were listed. And the teacher asked, are you having trouble? And she said, yes, a little bit. I, I can't, can't quite make up my mind with which wonder of the world I want to applaud. And the teacher said, well, tell me what you got. And the little girl hesitated, but she said, I think the seven wonders of the world are to see, to hear, to touch, to taste, to feel, to laugh, and to love. Amen. And everybody else just sat there in silence because I think they agreed with her. What that little girl described as the seven wonders of the world is what Jesus offered his disciples around that campfire. After a few weeks of feeling like a failure, he says, come on, let's see. Let's spend time together. Let's re-energize. Let's reconnect. And verse 12 says, none of the disciples dared to ask, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And then verse 13, Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. And then verse 14, this is now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. And this time after the miracle, just the meal made them know that's Jesus. That's Jesus. Quickly, I want to have you look at this passage, John 21, and I, I see a third answer. I, I believe they recognized Jesus. While at this meal, he offered them mercy. Miracle, meal, mercy. Jesus' mercy to the disciples, especially Peter, is personal. And I want you to know, I, I think even while we are here together today, even using me, he yet speaks to you personally. And you'll hear some things from Christ and the Holy Spirit and God the Father that you need as we are gathered together after we met around his table. But Jesus' mercy is personal. He calls us by name. Verse 15, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And there's a lot of debate of what he said these were. These fish, these boats, these other disciples, do you love me more than any of these? And Peter said, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And it was personal. I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Do you see how personal Jesus was with his disciples after they had been utter failures? And did you also catch that Jesus used Simon's fall name? Simon, son of John. Simon, son of Jonah. Depending on the, the version of scripture you read. Do you remember when you were a child? If you did something wrong and you needed to be corrected, what did your parent call you? I know what my mother called me. Kevin, Richard, Abel, you get in here. <laughs> and when those three names were listed together, I knew something had to be pointed out and something needed corrected. Jesus said, Peter, son of Jonah. Yeah, he knew he had messed up a big time in just days gone by. But you also get the sense Jesus wanted something better. You know, sometimes when we've really blown it, we think, can I ever be forgiven? And this story reminds us, yes, you can blow it one, two, or even three times, and you get a second, third, fourth, fifth chance. You can't be forgiven. Jesus' lesson to Peter, failure is not the end of the road. Giving up is the end of the road. Amen. 
when Peter had heard Jesus declare to the household of Zacchaeus, the son of man has come to seek and save the lost. And here on the seashore of Galilee, he says, hey, I've come to seek you. And if you've been lost, you come back home. And Peter learned to embrace what John later wrote. We love him because he first loved us. You see, Jesus' love for us is personal. And Jesus' mercy is also uh, something that inspires us to faithful service. Let's look at verses 16 and 17. After that first challenge, do you love me? And he said, yes, you know I love you. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt. Because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. And Jesus said this third time, feed my sheep. Now naturally, a lot of Bible students have put together this fireside chat between uh, Jesus and Peter and the the disciples. And, And they note that Prior to the cross and the death, burial, resurrection, Peter by a fireside had denied Jesus three times. Now, after the resurrection by a fireside, Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? And he said, yes, yes, yes. And what we see is the mercy of Jesus. And, you know, that, that phrase, do you love me? Uh, when I was preparing for this sermon, I, I got to thinking about times I, I was asked, to, do you love Jesus? And I went back to when I was in Bible college. And in, in my days in the 70s of Bible college, uh, um, you only had a new meal on Sunday. And we went to church on the campus. And after the church on the campus was done, they'd go stand in line waiting for the new meal and you were going to eat enough to get you through the night. And uh, they had a chorus. They often sang a lot of songs, but uh, they sang this one song that I, I hated. <laughs> I, just, I mean, they, there was often a girl in the group leading a, a song like, uh, Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. And they typically, some girl, would call out a student, and, and this is what I hated. They had to put you on the spot, and they'd sing in front of everybody else, and they'd say, Oh, Kevin, do you love Jesus? And I'd have to suck it up, and I'd have to say, Oh, yes, I love Jesus. Do you really love Jesus? And I'd go, Yes, I really love Jesus. And then they'd say, Tell me, why do you love Jesus? And I'd go, because he first loved me. Now you know why I hated it. I can't sing a lick. Everybody knew it. But they knew I loved Jesus. And that was in a ministry shaping time of my life. And I had to get out of my comfort zone and let my past, whoever I was, grow to be what God wanted me to be. That song pushed me out of my comfort zone, and that fireside chat for Peter did the same. Peter was asked, if you love me, feed my lambs. Peter was being called to a shepherding role in the church. You've been a failure. You know how it is, how you're going to have to bounce back. I'll be there with you. But you feed my lambs. You you lead the beginners to Christ. You've only been here three years, but you know how to grow from infancy to here. You feed my lambs. And then Peter was asked, if you love me, take care of my sheep. And the taking care of sheep uh, included more than just leading them. It was guiding them to pasture. It was protecting them from injuries and enemies. It, It was doctoring the illnesses. It was healing wounds. It was doing everything you could to make those sheep live long. Take care of my sheep. And then third, the Lord told Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. 
And so what he was trying to say is, you then keep feeding the mature to greater depths and greater strength. And we're called to do that as shepherds. And I keep thinking in my work, how can I make you deeper in the Lord? And one of the things we have evolved to here in the last three weeks is we've got this class of reviewing the pillars of the gospel. And, and we're veterans here, but we're going back to the basics so we can revisit what we once learned so we can go back and share with others and make more disciples in the future. Jesus restored Peter to the place of shepherding the flock. And he had spent three years training him, and he wasn't about to lose him because of a few failures along the way. And if you've ever blown it, you just get back in the saddle and you ride with Jesus again. C.S. Lewis famously said, we can ignore even pleasure, but pain, and even pain of failure, pain insists on being attended to. God whispers us to us in our pleasures. You can't hardly hear him if you think you're you got it going good. But God speaks in our conscience and shouts in our pain. And if there's a painful moment you're going through now, would you listen to the Lord? He's speaking. He welcomes you back, but he wants to challenge you to better days of the future. He uses a megaphone to arouse the deaf world, and he uses our pain. Peter's recent litany of failures are, patient, uh, are, are, are just painful experiences. But God is, through Christ, saying, use them for my good. Don't waste the pain. Channel the pain. Shepherds God people using your growth from and Jesus doesn't call the perfect, but he does perfect us who are being called. And I want you to know that any shepherd who functions in the church is always still a work in progress. I, I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm trying to still grow as my seasons of life change. That's God's mercy. And he's merciful to you. And Jesus' mercy does not mean, though, life is going to get easier. <laughs> well, that's not good to hear, but I'm just telling you the truth. If it was true for Peter, it'll be true for us. Look at verse 18. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself. You were able to take care of yourself alone. But you went and you went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone will dress you and lead you where you don't want to go. Verse 19 says, Jesus said this to the day the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said, follow me. He was kind of saying, follow me to your cross. Jesus' words are kind of like the mission impossible day. Your mission, Peter, should you choose to or decide to accept it, you will be caught and killed. And then this tape will self-construct in five seconds. Good luck, Peter. Jesus is predicting the way Peter's going to die. You will literally stretch out your hands and others will dress you or undress you. And you'll be led where you don't want to go. But in that death, you will glorify God. Now, church historians, the Bible does not teach this in any of the writings, but church historians like you see the state this. About 34 years after this, Peter was crucified. But he begged to be crucified with his head downwards because he didn't consider himself worthy to die in the same posture as his Lord. We know all the apostles Except John died a martyr's death. John was exiled to the island of Patmos, and there he wrote the book Revelation. God's last revelation to the church. Hey, victory is on its way. And so uh, Jesus' mercy means life 
doesn't necessarily get easier. But stay faithful. Follow Jesus. And then quickly, Jesus' mercy doesn't lead to equal sacrifice. Uh, we're not all going to sacrifice equally, but we're all called to serve. Verse 20, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following him. And that means John was following him. This one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, John, he said, Lord, what about him? You tell me I'm going to die this way. What about him? Jesus says, I'm going to need to remain alive until I return. What is that to you? You must follow me. In verse 23, it says, because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. And he didn't die a martyr's death, but he was punished for his faithfulness. And so, uh, the same price wasn't paid by John that he did. William Barclay, the great commentary, noted this. Paul became the great pioneer and preacher of Christ. He established churches all over Asia Minor. And then he said, Peter became the great shepherd of the church. But it's John who became the great witness and writer for the church. Peter didn't write a gospel. Paul didn't write a gospel. John wrote the gospel that we're finishing up today. John wrote three letters, first, second, third John, and John wrote the book of Revelation. You see, not all of us are going to be Billy Graham or Mother Teresa, but we are called to use our life experiences, our faith in Jesus, to do something to build up the kingdom of God. And so the real lesson at this campfire is all are going to be asked to equally serve. Everybody gets asked to serve. It's a ministry of all believers. But when our lives of service on earth is done, it might be different sacrifices we made along the way. But I want you to know when our life on earth is done, it will be worth it all. Amen? Amen. Amen. However we serve, however we sacrifice, Jesus is preparing a place for us. It will be out of this world. And with that, John says, Jesus' first is trustworthy. This is the disciple, John, who testifies to these things, who wrote them down. We know that his, Jesus' testimony is true. Jesus did many things as well. Even if every one of them had been written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have enough room for the books that could be written. Boy, we got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but there could be many more. And the libraries would be full telling them to trust in such a Jesus. I grew up in a church that sang this old song, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for his grace, to trust in the Lord. And I think we follow this risen Lord because we recognize the miracle He does in our life, the times we share around tables with brothers and sisters in His name, and the truth that He calls us in His mercy from failure to ministry all the time. And today I just declare to you, would you trust in the risen Lord? You trust this Jesus. Would you stand with me? Let's go. You've heard of Jesus in the last now 21 weeks. Some of you are probably glad we're done with this book. Next week we'll open the book of Galatians and that's six chapters. And the next week we'll start our Bible studies on Wednesdays and Thursdays to go in depth on each chapter.
I think we're growing in Christ by going into God's Word. I'm growing as we've done this. I want to go deeper. I want you to join with me in believing in the risen Lord. Maybe today you have heard something about Jesus. And maybe you're like Peter. You need to be restored. Jesus welcomes the restoration. He went to the cross to forgive every sin. Would you believe in him? Would you repent of sin? Would you confess Christ? Would you be baptized if you've never done that? The day of Pentecost, Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of sin, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We offer that invitation to you. Maybe some are saved. You just need a home church. We offer a time like this for you to come with those who might make first decisions to make a second decision. I need a home church. Confess Christ. Work with us. And we'll have a family that meets around the table every week for communion and the meeting of the Lord in this world. Would you come if you need to make a decision for Jesus?
Amen. Thank you so much for joining with us online today and worshiping with us together. As always, we hope that next Sunday you will come into the building and worship with us side by side. But if for any reason you cannot, please, please come back to this Facebook um, worship time and worship with us again in this way. We have been so blessed by your presence here. And we hope that you have an awesome and wonderful and blessed week. And one way or another, we will see you next Sunday.